Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. And today's talk is all about money, finances, economy. With that, I have guest Jonathan Baer. He's an expert in this area coming out of Canada, and I'm really happy to have him on the show to share his wisdom experience. So Jonathan, welcome. Thanks very much. I'm pleased to be here. Yeah. I know uh, just really briefly uh, talk about your experience and then how you help clients. I've got a long experience as a money manager, mostly mutual funds. I've been fortunate enough to win a couple of awards and I've uh, managed a number of number one ranked uh, funds that had not only uh, a North American, but an international mandate. And uh, more recently, for the past seven years, I've been writing a monthly publication called the Global Investment Letter, which I'm happy to say has, has really grown and has subscribers in all the continents now, except, of course, for Antarctica. And what's interesting in writing the Global Investment Letter, because of its mandate of being global and having a sense of financial history and geopolitics and so on, is a somewhat unique situation we find ourselves in today. I think the uh, geopolitical and economic situation that we're in today is probably the most tenuous since the end of World War II. Yeah, it's really interesting that you said that because you're talking about, you're based in Canada and I, I feel it here. I feel it most pronounced here. Talk about, is this a worldwide phenomenon or is this just a U.S. phenomenon or talk about what are your thoughts? By no means is it just a U.S. phenomenon. The problems that we face in terms of debt levels, that's something that all developed countries share. All so-called Western countries have, have issues with, with high amounts of debt. The geopolitical scene is something that, once again, all countries, particularly Western countries, have to consider and have to contend with in terms of issues with Russia and China and obviously the war in Ukraine and the larger implications of that and so on. The Middle East with its potential effects on the price of oil, not to mention the humanitarian aspects as well. The issues that Americans might feel are certainly largely being felt by Canadians and, and Europeans and Japanese and so on. Oh, interesting. And I'm, um, like I said, U.S. citizen, and uh, I've seen basically the decline of the country over the last, over the last 30 something years, it's just getting worse. And like, even like cities, like this, this summer I was enforced, but I was like, I couldn't take it anymore. Like I had to go to another locale with like better infrastructure, water, you know, all this stuff. And is that the same in Canada as well? I'm just trying to get it. No, a I, you know, from a Canadian perspective, I think you're being a little hard on the United States. It's, <laughs> it's still the largest economy in the world and the U.S. dollar is still the world's reserve currency. And I expect that to continue for the foreseeable future because I don't see a credible alternative. Oh. Every country has got problems. And I do know that there are issues with electricity in Texas with brownouts and so on. So that's made the papers up here and so on. And that's unfortunate. But the United States, obviously, uh, still a lot going for it and so on. I think the issue with Texas in particular is it's, it's so hot that the demands for electricity, for air conditioning and so on, is staying ahead of infrastructure builds and so on. Uh -huh. uh, but I think a lot of the the basic issues that Americans might feel in terms of, let's say, the effects of inflation and so on are being felt in Canada and in Europe. Certainly, if you go to a grocery store anywhere, I've, a friend of mine in England, and a, certainly I've seen it here in Canada, where we see inflation the most is in day-to-day in -day things like groceries and so on. And so, you know, I mean, we, I think we all share to a, lot, to a greater extent extent the same issues. Each country has its own political nuances and so on, but the basic economic and day-to-day -day life issues, I think, are the same for us all. Uh -huh. And what about geopolitically? Because they are all countries going towards more of a socialist, communist, like censorship, decreased freedom of speech, human rights, um, and more like government corruption, oligarchy, um, social unrest, all these things. Is that the same? 
We're not seeing that in Canada, I'm, I'm <laughs> pleased to say. Uh, and I don't think we're uh, seeing it uh, in Europe. I think what's potentially a bit disturbing is the rise of far-right country political parties in Europe. Um, because we saw something similar in the 1920s and 1930s, and that clear that clearly did not end well. From myself as an investor and just as a citizen, I would prefer to see things take a more moderate turn down the middle. I don't believe in ext political extremes to the left or right. So uh, I think that we've made much more progress as a civilization by adopting more of a moderate approach. No, Canada obviously has its issues like any other country, as does Europe and so on. But no, I don't think there's anything been dramatic occurring. Yeah. Um, and the when you look at it, the U.S. stock market, even though it's been weak of late, it's still very near its all-time highs. So if you're looking at it from a very narrow lens of just an investor, the things are not too bad. Yeah. But then which brings me, because you were talking about, you know, this whole thing is about economics and investments, and I was trying to lay the landscape of risk. So as an investor, you know, given all of these risks, you get so much uncertainty. It's like, how are you positioning? Like, I know real estate is suffering. We've got interest rates, all this stuff. Like, what, how are you positioning yourself? What I do each month is part of the, a part of the service I provide with the global investment letter and along with the sort of me updating my views on, on, on the global markets in terms of stock markets, bond markets, and currencies and commodities is I also share what I'm doing as investing wise each month. And I talk about why I've taken a position. And one thing that I advocate very strongly is the use of what I call protective sell prices, where I, when I buy a position, I will have an idea of how much risk I want to take on the position and set a sell price that if it penetrates that sell price, I'll close the position. And that's done with, with you know, after analysis of fundamental and technical analysis. So this past year has been quite busy and it's also been quite successful. I, been managing money for quite a while. And so the pragmatic approach that I've, that I've developed has done and is continuing to do well over time. I do think that we're in a risky investment environment and that we can look forward to a good deal of uh, market volatility. But having said that, even though a lot of people associate volatility with risk, which, which is true, it's also associated with producing a lot of great investment opportunities because the volatility will end up driving markets to extremes, both, both high, but mostly volatility will drive markets lower. And that can set up very good risk return opportunities for investors. So I think the balance of this decade is going to be quite volatile for the economic and geopolitical factors that we've discussed earlier. But I also think that if you're pragmatic and you're disciplined in terms of risk management and you're prepared to seize the opportunities, there's going to be some great opportunities to produce some very good returns over the, over the next few years. I do think the 2020s are going to ultimately be characterized for their volatility. And I've been saying, I was, I started writing that back probably in 2015. And certainly the decade so far is playing out that way. When you consider in 2020, we had the, the COVID pandemic and then which produced a COVID inspired market crash and so on. And then we've gone from there. And then we had interest rates rising for the first time in, in decades. So this, this characterization of mine of volatility certainly is playing out and I expect it to continue in the coming years. So I'm, I am positioned in a variety of markets as well as, as commodities. One position that I've had for a number of months this year, which is working very well is gold. Not that I'm a gold bug. I'm not a gold bug, but I'm prepared to buy any market if the, the risk reward looks appropriate. 
and I'll hold the position in gold and until I think that it's not uh, justified in a more than I'll sell it. So I just have to hasten to add that I'm not a gold bug because there is a constituency out there that will just buy gold regardless. I, I buy gold when I think the price is going to go up, not because it has any magical properties or so. Yeah. Which, which is interesting when you say position yourself to seize these gains, are they basically do dollar cost average into the sectors or is it like semiconductor? Is it AI? Is it tech? Is yeah. It yeah. Sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll buy just broad markets. If I think that that looks like a great opportunity, the S and P 500, uh, has been a, an excellent place to be. Although I did sell my position in the S and P 500 in August. Now, that doesn't mean that I won't buy again at some point in the future. What I'll also do is have some positions in certain industries that I like that I think will merit, merit long-term attention. So my long-term investment themes would be things like healthcare and the defense sector and so on. I mentioned I'll, I'll buy commodities, I'll buy gold. I will even take positions in, in currencies as well. Now, the goal of what I'm doing in the global investment layer is just to write about what I'm doing and to help people make better investment decisions themselves. Because I, besides talking about the investments, I'll talk about where interest rates are going, about geopolitics, about other types of risks. And people don't have to... In fact, I encourage people to think for themselves. People don't have to follow what I'm doing. I really think of the global investment letter as a way for me to share the experience that I've developed over three decades as a money manager, as a, as a learning tool. And I, I find the investment business, the process of investment, so intellectually challenging that I get so much fun out of trying to figure out what's going on in the world and how to interpret it in terms of investment standpoint and so on. That kind of enthusiasm and, and, and interest, I, I, I try and impart as well when I write the issues. Interesting. What are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Should you allocate zero, one, three, five percent? I don't own any Bitcoin. And the reason I don't own any Bitcoin is ultimately... It, there's nothing there. It's a ledger in a computer. It's a it's a electrons in a on a computer chip or in a computer memory. There's no tangible asset there. It's only worth what people are prepared to, to pay for it. I've got a bit of a I've got, now it could be a function of my age or experience, but I have a problem with the notion of of buying that. Now, if people want to do that, you know. Good luck to them and so on. I'm not knocking anybody for buying Bitcoin. It's certainly gone up a lot. Uh, but one of the things that I try and do is try and uh, invest in things that I understand. And I don't really understand Bitcoin. I don't understand non-fungible uh, tokens. I probably wouldn't have understood the, the tulip bulb centuries <laughs> ago when that was a mania. But it's just it's just a, a personal preference, and and certainly people should be free to do whatever they want. Yeah, I was asking because you had mentioned gold, and now everybody's saying like this is the new form of digital gold in Argentina and El Salvador, and a lot of and also companies putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet. So it just looks like it's she is it legit? Was it still early? But it's that's why I'm, I ask everybody. It's just yes. I want to get. No, I understand that, and and certainly it's a thing. But I just don't. It's just not for me. I I wish I could get my head around it, but at the, at the end of the day, it's not real. It's not backed by any. It's not at least the U.S. dollar is backed by the U.S. government or the British pound, or notionally you've got the credit of the United States or Britain or any other currency. There's just nothing behind it. And, but once again, I think people should do whatever they're comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically with the consensus is what do people flock to in times of stress or what people 
flock to for a store of value or how they, or how do they transact is like currency the rich buy art and things in the past it was seashells and also salt salt became commoditized you know it became yeah. valuable so yeah. anything ultimately can be used as money as long as uh, somebody see some value in it. So whether it's gold or silver, like you said, at one point salt was because it wasn't as plentiful as it is now. So no, you're absolutely right. Bearing that in mind, because we have a a choice of what we want to invest in, I don't feel compelled to invest in Bitcoin or (laughs) like I said, I have a position in gold right now, you know, a month from now, circumstances may change and I may change, you know, my mind on it. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on the, because you mentioned oil and wars and a lot of countries are now, like, because of the sanctions against like China and Russia, a lot of countries see that and they're like holding dollars is, is risky or putting it in a U.S. bank is risky because it can get confiscated. So what do you see the status of the dollar as the world's reserve currency? Is it, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. I, right now, I don't see any reason why it won't continue to be the world's reserve currency. The United States is the largest uh, economy in the world. It's got the largest military. Geographically, it's, it's in a safe place. It's got a couple of oceans on either side. It's got a very friendly neighbor to the north. It's, no, and in, in a lot of ways, it's a very uh, lucky country. And I don't see... I don't see any really compelling alternative to the U.S. dollar in terms of a alternative currency that one might use. The U.S. dollar has been weak over the last couple of months and so on. I think one of the reasons for that, in fact, I'm sure one of the reasons for that, is the view of consensus opinion that the Fed is going to very aggressively lower interest rates. Mm -hmm. And if it does that, the, infer- the interest rate differential between uh, for people holding dollars versus other currencies is going to shrink. And wow. that makes the dollar relatively less attractive against another currency. Because up until recently, the dollar enjoyed a very favorable interest rate differential positive. Uh-huh. It's still positive, but it's going to be decreasing in size, which is going to put downward pressure on the U.S. dollar. So I, I think that is playing a large role in why the dollar has been weak over the last couple of months. If we have some kind of a global crisis, like the Middle East blows up or, some, or something, the situation between Russia and Ukraine escalates even further and the level of fear globally starts to rise, I believe you'll start seeing capital flowing into the U.S. dollar which will tend to support the dollar. And that's what historically is hap- Well, it, it, that's historically what's happened, at least since the dollar has been a reserve currency since it took over from the British pound, you know, about a hundred years ago or so. <laughs> so, you know, for those reasons, I think that the dollar is going to fluctuate, you know, as all currencies do. But, you know, if I had to, you know, pick one currency to hold, you know, for five or 10 or 20 years, it'd probably still be the U.S. dollar. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, U.S., like I said, U.S. still has it, even Canadian euros, all that. Do you think what we're seeing is just a changing of the guards? Because you mentioned England 100 years ago, then U.S. came in, and then now potentially China or India, Latin America, and all these different, is that what you were seeing? Is that kind of the normal transition? I think we're seeing that. The, I think it's fair to say that the, the relative influence economically and probably geopolitically of the West is starting to decline in the past few decades from where it was back in the ninth after World War II, let's say. Mm-hmm. And I do believe that in another 30 or 40 or 50 years, the, the two largest economies are likely to be China and India. Mm. Because between the two of them, they have over a third of the world's population. So that, but by itself, if you can, if, you know, when you've got over 2 billion people and assuming that you can adopt reasonably effective economic practices, the amount of economic leverage inherent in those nations 
should make them grow very, very rapidly. Certainly what China has done over the last 30 or 40 years has been remarkable in terms of its growth. It's having a bit of a hiccup right now, but that, that's to be expected in the history of a nation. Now, the big caveat, you know, any talk about, you know, how big any country is going to be in 20 or 30 or 40 years is going to be whether there are adverse political developments. If the political scene goes backwards in terms of not paying attention to practical economic practices and so on, then that, that could really hobble the growth of any country. But all things being equal, right now, I think China and India are, are going to be economically fast growing and very dominant economies. It doesn't mean that the, the West, the so-called West is going to all of a sudden collapse or anything. It's just that its relative influence is going to be somewhat less than it was. And that was, that was inevitable. Back 2000 years ago, ancient Rome was basically controlled most of the known world when things changed. China back centuries ago, what was a dominant economic power for many years, many centuries. And then it had obviously problems that obviously it, 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 it's been resolved. Time uh, does tend to produce changes. Yeah, I think emerging, emerging markets like India is, is a favorite of mine. I think that as long as there's no real political adverse development in India, that's going to be a, an interesting place to invest in um, for the next two or three decades. Yeah, no, well, we have, cut, I think we have eight minutes remaining and I wanted to ask you about Africa and Latin America, but I wanted to touch on interest rates and do you think the U.S. held interest rates so high for so long was to wage economic warfare against China? I'm just, the, my thinking was like all the data, now the, these economic reports and everything and or is this, and then we don't even know if he's most likely going to cut in, in a week or so, but uh, my thinking was like, you're doing this to uh, basically harm the currency of the uh, of your um, opposing country. Is that in line? Or no, I, I I don't think that's the case. Um, no, I I can also tell you that when I was a kid, I could remember interest rates being up around twenty percent <laughs> Canada and the United States. Yeah, the interest rates that we've had recently are really just long term normal levels. Hmm. What we had previous to that were historic anomalies in terms of interest rates almost at, to zero. And in fact, in some countries, they were negative. So no, I don't think that's the case. I think um, what happened was that the Fed rose rates in response to inflation. Mm -hmm. It also, I think, saw the appearance of inflation as an opportunity to try and get rates back to more normal levels. Because the, the period of time that we've had with ultra low interest rates, it, it, it tends to distort and warp the economy mm -hmm. uh, because it allocates uh, capital in, in inefficient ways and creates bubbles. So the Fed raised rates, I think, in response to uh, inflation and also uh, as a means to try and get rates to a more normal level for the state of the general economy. Mm -hmm. They're attempting to finesse the economy now by everyone expects, and it looks like it's going to happen, they're going to cut rates later this month because they see evidence of a slowdown and a recession coming. So they're attempting to finesse a, sort of, uh, a soft landing. We're going to see lower rates in the short term. I don't know how much lower rates will go over the next year. Consensus opinion is that they're going to drop like a stone over the next 12 months. I'm going to be very careful and, and watch how that goes because a lot will depend on how inflation reacts to lowering rates and so on. And one of the things that the Fed is aware of is the lessons of the 1970s when we had this terrible decade of, of inflation. And one of the mistakes the Fed did at that time 
was to raise rates, then cut them prematurely, which allowed inflation to, to just soar. And they did that a couple of times before Paul Volcker ended up deciding he was going to take on inflation once and for all and rose rates up to circa 20%, which, you know, which was the peak of interest rates for the next four decades. So no, you know, to me, the interest rates that we've had recently, they're normal interest rates. What we had before was abnormal, but they're coming down now. Well, I guess I'm not as aggressive in terms of what I expect them to come down to as consensus opinion. We'll see. Hmm. How can people find you? And I know you mentioned your newsletter and sign up for your newsletter. Yeah, yeah. There's a website and it's a globalinvestmentletter.com. Mm -hmm. And for people that would like to see some sample issues, there are a, a bunch of free sample issues up there. All I ask is that you leave your name and your email address. And then what you can, what you'll also get by leaving your name and an email address is I do a weekly market commentary every Tuesday, comes out Tuesdays afternoons at about two o'clock. And you'll also be, you'll also start receiving that. Now, for people that don't want to receive the weekly investment commentary, they can unsubscribe at any time. Mm -hmm. But the, the global investment letter, I'm, I've been happy to say has had some very good results. I think for people that are interested in looking at the world of investing, I think it offers a lot of value. And my approach to whether it's the global investment letter or any type of knowledge or learning, particularly with investing is, if I get one good idea about reading a book on investing or reading a newsletter, if I get one good idea, that's probably worth many times the price of the subscription or the book or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's the approach that, that I've always adopted myself as a money manager. And it, it, it's, it's what I encourage people to think of as well when they're looking for investment information and opinion and so on. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I love talking in a really interesting conversation. We know there are so many other questions, but thanks so much. And for the audience, be sure to check out Jonathan's resources. will be in the show notes and his socials. And thanks so much for coming on. It was my pleasure. Thanks very much.